I didn't see that one coming. This is the last time we're ever going to be doing this. It's completely unexpected. I, I, I mean, I audibly gasp. <gasps> first episodes of every season are always a challenge. But for the final season, it was a lot of pressure because we had all these characters convening at Winterfell. We thought the, the rival was a way to capture what was at stake for Danny and for Jon, for Arya on the ground, and for Tyrion and Varys, and Grey Worm and Missandei on horseback. Everybody has a slightly different take on what's happening here. Background! David Nutter directed half the season for us, and there's no more beloved director in the business. Usually a director on Game of Thrones will shoot for three days, and he has two days prep, and then he maybe shoots for a full week, but Nutter just had to go all out for eight or nine weeks of shooting. I was so happy that he was back for the final season. David Nutter really felt like part of the family. We shot uh, a lot of the parade stuff at the end of the year where we had kind of the two shortest days of the year, and then we came back and it kind of brought some scope to it. Winter's Town is a settlement just outside of Winterfell. And so that road was, was snowed. We built the little buildings that led up the road. It was completely redressed to be the Winterfell little town. It's basically a huge parade. The AD sort out background villagers, reactions, so you're actually working with the extras in a way so you're getting a performance out of everybody. We work with the military advisors, so all of these guys look professional marching step. <laughs> When we tell them to do something, they do it. We teach them some very basic drill movements so they know how to stand. Everything's under a command, a whistle blast, so they get to learn to react in a military style, in a disciplined style. Anything that's on the page, we tend to show rather than just imply. If you're going to say you want to see thousands of Unsullied, then we have to show it. It's a significant big scope moment. So the challenge was definitely to find ways to really make it seem like thousands are arriving. You have to have a vantage point from higher up. When I read the opening sequence and I saw this little boy running to try to see the parade and see the show and see what he's missing, I felt like that little boy, because I'd been gone for two seasons. So in some respects, I kind of was that little boy. Daenerys arrives and immediately Sansa wants to make it very clear that she runs this shit. This is a tough crowd. I think Jon knows Sansa well enough now that when it comes to Danny, he knows he's gonna have some difficulty. Jon is in love with her, has bent the knee, he's got googly eyes on, he's got like beer goggles on. I basically sat down with Sophie and told her, you have to remember one thing. This is your house. Queen Daenerys of House Targaryen. Thank you for inviting us into your home, Lady Stark. The North is as beautiful as your brother claimed. As are you. You're meeting the family. You want to do well. You want them to like you, goddammit. And um, you're met with a stony, stoic silence. It's not a comfortable homecoming, no. There were a lot of people on set, kind of like a giant game of Where's Waldo. In the first episode, a couple of our friends from the comedy world were in a scene. They gouged my eye out. <laughs> they gouged my fucking eye out. They can put it back in, right? Right? Yeah. They Benioff told me they would. When we found out that George Lucas wanted to visit, we thought maybe it was a practical joke. And then we were really excited and also nervous because it's George Lucas. Your sister doesn't like me. If it makes you feel any better, she didn't like me either when we were growing up. Now, Prince. For George to be sitting at my director's chair, that was so cool for me. I had George while I'd speak to uh, Kit and Amelia. OK, OK, that was great, great, great. No direction for you. I don't really care about you. <laughs> I don't care what happens to you. Yeah, what? What? What's going on? I mean, like, the first time, like, I could remember telling stories was me as a little kid mashing together these, like, Stormtrooper dolls. For so many of us, he's the one who started our obsession with this kind of big, epic storytelling. And, of course, the end puts a fever through the writer Dave Hill's head. Three, two, one, go! 
I very much learned the lesson that sometimes when you write two words that you then create so much work for everyone involved. Oh, I get an ax in the head. Simple enough. Next thing I know, I'm flying to London to go out to have my face sculpted, be wrapped in plaster and molded. The day of, I'm in a chair for four and a half hours. It was great to see that we were basically going to get to take Dave Hill out, um, one of our writers. It's, it's quite nice to be able to um, kill fellow crew members off in the nicest kind of way. Having to go and be the one who gives the performance is so much more difficult than I imagined. And I was just trying desperately not to screw it up. And it did, the first time. And then the second time got it right. The Godswood Tree, such an iconic piece of the show. To create that Godswood Tree is a huge amount of effort. Every year it would have to be painted white, it would be coated in latex, a sculpted face would be applied to it. The Greens team would go about adding branches to it with flocked red leaves that Kevin Fraser uh, would paint up for us. It's a process where you take a flock, which is a fibre, and actually adhere it to the leaf on one surface. So obviously you got some quite interesting dynamics when things were lit and shot. He used to be taller. When I first got the scripts, there's like a bunch of lords and ladies talking, and I was thinking, are we ever going to get a scene together again? And then finally got to that scene, and I was just beaming. The really spooky thing was turning around and seeing her for the first time. And what I wanted to try and get was this kind of punch to the gut of literally turning around and seeing time having passed. You still have the sword? Needle. Needle. The most amazing thing happened. I just didn't have to do anything. Because you had two actors who hadn't worked together since season one to get a chance to show pure, true love. <laughs> the one thing I've told the actors in season eight, the audience just want to see you breathe. The Watch Kit Bro as an actor on the show has been incredible. And I think the fans are going to love it, because I loved it. <laughs> I hit you right in the sorry, face. I'm good. so sorry. <laughs> Part of the fun of the episode was bringing back together all these characters. It's also the challenge of the episode because you don't want it to feel like it's, you know, just the reunion episode. Ready and action. Leave him be. The Hound and Gendry, we thought it would make sense for kind of the one-two punch of these two people who would serve very, very different roles in her life. Is that command, Lady Stark? Don't call me that. He still thinks that she's the same girl that he left beforehand. We've got him better. Yeah, thanks. So have you. I think for Arya, it's remembering who she was before. I mean, you look good. Thanks. Like, I used to be that girl, and that's who I was in love with and, and thought I would just follow to the end of the world. The Hound Arya reunion, that's the thing we were most excited about writing. You left me to die. First, I robbed you. Everyone would hope that the reunion between Arya and the Hound would be laughs and giggles, but actually it starts off as like cold because it's kind of the defense mechanism for both characters. You're a cold little bitch, aren't you? Guess that's why you're still alive. There's also Tyrion and Sansa. There's something between Tyrion and Sansa that you can't quite put your finger on because they're you left me, and then you know what happened to me, and I know what happened to you. Apologies for leaving like that. Yes, it was a bit hard to explain why my wife fled moments after the king's murder. It's tricky with them. They have to watch their words around each other, but at the end of the day, she does trust him. And at the very end, we have the silent reunion with Jamie and Bran. If he tells the rest of the clan the truth, I'm, I'm done. I'm dead. To me, I wanted to make sure that with respect to people getting back together again, those all had their credence and importance, but also I didn't want the audience to forget the fact that the impending doom was coming. Hey, camera mark. They're coming. There's no way around it. <laughs> this is a great horror movie sequence that Dave Nutter um, directed the hell out of. Somehow, Beric and Tormund survived falling down that wall of ice. We find that it's strangely, there's blood everywhere, but there's no bodies. 
Stay back, he's got blue eyes! I've always had blue eyes! Did you find anyone? The scene in The Last Earth, we have some mandala of limbs and body parts the Night King has left behind, uh, which form this kind of pattern. And in the middle of it, we have Nedumba, who's basically pinned to the wall on a huge stake. Obviously, we know what happens to people who are killed by the Night King and the White Walkers. <laughs> the young boy was suspended in a harness, and then to basically kill the White, Beric uses his flaming sword and takes out the White. We had to shoot that on um, a stunt guy called Paul Lowe, who was a similar sort of stature to um, the, the actor playing Ned. Game of Thrones is the, the first time I don't I don't a full burn, so that's a nice tick. What I guess a lot of stuntmen want to want to have. And for that, because he was going to be engulfed in flames, we had to make a lookalike fire mask. Now we good. You can hear me, okay? Yeah. I love what you, I love what you done with your hair. It's a message from the Night King. Being Beric and Darian, I'm always setting people on fire. You have the mask off. You talk through it. What the process is going to be. Then we'll roll the cameras. Okay. The first three, two, one will be to light the sword. Then it'll be three, two, one, action for Nick to stab you. You lift your arm up to stab on three, okay? On action, he's gonna stab you. Hold this position like this. When you hear me start to count, that's when you start to react. You then have to go and, and do it. They'll gel you, they'll spit you, and they'll light you. You have an idea of what it's going to be like, but when I was set on fire, you've only got these little small eye holes. All I could see were little flick, flicks in my eyes of like a little bit of red. And the first time they done it, and it like it went over and they put me out. And I said, "Was I on fire?" And he said, "Yeah, it was massive." You've completely ruined horses for me. <laughs> it almost seemed like he knew where I wanted to go. No point. Oh, fuck it. Fuck's sake. <laughs> We're shooting in Iceland. Isn't it beautiful? We only have about six hours of light, so we all come out about three hours before the sun rises. Grip and electric get to lay about a 40 foot track. Our department was laying down all the bones for our nest for our dragons. Some of those locales in Iceland are so breathtaking that real environments just help the actors so much. So if it's Kit and Amelia walking past a, a frozen river in Iceland and they're shivering, that's real. Yeah, this fire lady dragon mama is nuts, used to the cold. No problem, I can stand in snow all day. I just love I could go there with Amelia. I got to show this thing that's been such a large part of the Thrones world for me. I got to show her Iceland. Magic dragon ride. I like it. It's just felt like the magic carpet ride. We're just sort of playing tig and the dragons. <laughs> it's beautiful. We were lucky to get a great day of aerial photography in Iceland with a helicopter shooting these most beautiful river canyons with beautiful snow coverage. And then where they land was meant to be a very pristine and gorgeous location as well. Dan and David said, you know, maybe you know, can we have a waterfall here? So we went all the way to Iceland, to this beautiful canyon, and then we end up adding a massive waterfall later on in post because it still wasn't quite spectacular. Ooh! Oh. 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 Uh, let's roll, please. Rolling, rolling. I think the actual dragon ride <laughs> was like... Yeah, it's one bit where you've got to convey your love for each other and you're in a green box on a, on a buck. So much of what we're doing now requires robotics. We'll start with previs, and in order to then shoot it, we'll go onto a green screen stage with a motion base, which is kind of like a mechanical bull, only in this case, it's got a dragon's butt on top of it. And then the cameras are swinging around on a 3D controlled wire rig programmed to match the previs. Don't know how to ride a dragon. Butt work is not easy. I think what sums up the buck for me was there was a bit where John almost falls off the dragon, swings round really violently like this, and my right ball got trapped 
and I didn't have time to say stop. And I was being swung round in my head. I thought this is how it ends, on this buck, swinging me round by my testicles, literally. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, probably, probably too much information. It's just way too much to take. I was joking with John of like, how do you, as an act, how do you receive all those bits of information? Like, how do you possibly try and act that when they've got death raining down on them? And suddenly he finds out the truth about his life, that he's not a bastard, that everything he's lived by is not the case. And on top of that, that his new, his new love of his life is his aunt. Like, I mean, I was like, oh, come on, this is an impossible task. I wasn't a king. But you were. You've always been. He wouldn't want to hurt John with it. He, he would only tell John that if it was the truth. If there's one thing he knows about Sam, he knows that his Sam is a stickler for facts, and Sam is very literal. You've never been a bastard. You are Egon Targaryen, true heir to the Iron Throne. The way to get round it was disbelief, like Sam's gone mad, what are you talking about? Quickly followed by it making sense and anger. You're the true king, Aegon Targaryen, sixth of his name, protector of the realm, all of it. Well, I don't care if you're my best friend in the world, I will, I will knock you out. How dare you tell this to me? My father was the most honorable man I ever met. Your father, what? Ned Stark, he promised your mother he'd always protect you. And he did. Robert would have murdered you if he knew. And uh, the truth that Samwell tells John is probably the most incendiary fact in the entire world of the show. Ned Stark understood how dangerous uh, the truth about John was, and that's why he protected John from it. You gave up your crown to save your people. Would she do the same?